right. So <clears throat> what I would like to do now is uh, just a quick warm-up session. It is about nothing sophisticated. I'm not talking about Azure. I don't even need Wi-Fi. Actually, I don't even need PowerShell. Um, what I've done is I looked at our internal MVP list. We have an MVP email list where all the MVPs can ask questions. And looked at a couple of questions that came up. MVPs are supposed to be real experts, and they are, but sometimes the questions are kind of stupid too. So this is a, a great way for you to see if you would have known the answer. A couple of quirks, and I would love to have this interactive. So we have our hostess. She has a microphone. So if you're, anyone wants to comment on anything, please go ahead. All right, here is a first example. Hey, you, you see a variable, and you see three evaluations. And the question that came up was, is this a bug or am I forgetting or missing something? I would expect at least test one and two below to be true. So take a look at this. Let it sink in. We are all supposed to be PowerShell experts. Does anyone see why this, the last two one, why they would, or oh, how they would be? Can you say it again? It needs a, yeah, it's a wild card. But what is the wild card here? Basically, it's not a regular expression. The solution would be you would have to write it like this or like this. So a, the, the brackets are really a wild card for like. Like is not regex. It has star, question mark, and the brackets. So if you want to submit something that really needs to be a literal black bracket, you need to escape it and make sure that you double escape it when you use co double quotes. The first one escapes the escape, and then it escapes the bracket. Anyway, these kind of questions, you know, that's, that's the idea behind all of, all of this. Here's another one. You see two ways of accessing a file. The first one is get child item. The next one is get item. And then everything looks like you got the same type of objects. So both point to the same full name. Both are a file info object. However, at the end, when you do it to string, they report different text. And the question would be, I have the same spacing problem you had, but I didn't fix it. <laughs> I don't recall seeing this oddity before, so I thought I'd share it to see if others knew about it. Does anyone know why to string for these identical objects would yield a different output? Well. To string really is a fuzzy way of telling you what, a, what an object is. The only real way of getting reproducible results would be to access a particular property like full name. Here's an example. When I take an integer variable A and I add member, I overwrite to string with a script method, then suddenly my integer tells me something completely different. So I can sort of write anything in my to string that I want. And basically, with these objects, depending on how you initialize them, they use different algorithms. The first ones that said, OK, the file name is OK to represent you. And the, the other object initializer said, OK, I better put in the full file path. What that means is never use to string if you want to depend on something exactly. It is simply something to sort of put an object into a text representation. Although that is fun, A is still an integer. It still equals 1. But it's simply, visually, it's saying go away. It's basically something you can use as well if you want to have good printed output, but you would still remain the value to be numeric, so you can process it as an integer. OK, quirks with .NET methods. Here's um, something that some people run into. Does anyone know why I get this weird test instead of trimming? and getting test. Yeah, it trims all the characters. So when people start using .NET methods, which is great, they sometimes go intuitively. They don't take a necessarily look at, it, at the true syntax. If you would do that, you would see that it takes a character array. So trim takes a character array. It doesn't take the text that it trims away. It simply takes an array of characters and all of these characters are the ones that are trimmed. So in the previous example, I was trim this was wrong anyway. I, it would have been sufficient to say dot .tx. I didn't need a 
double T, it's just an array. So it was sort of uh, trimming away all these characters. Say again? Can you go with a microphone? Uh, oh, I don't hear anything. But that's good because we have two different session types here. We have one that is more frontal presentation, telling you good things, and then there are other sessions where we really want to get into discussion. And um, one thing I forgot to mention was this morning, while the microphone is going to you, on your map you see six breakout session rooms. They are simply sitting there. They're equipped with full AV. You can simply take a room if you would like to do a whiteboard session, if you want to do something special. Take one of those rooms. They're just there for you. Okay. Yeah, hi. Uh, if I understood the, the previous example, would it not uh, return C uh, backslash ES instead of TES? Huh? Uh, because, it, ah, yeah, cool. Right. No, no, no. Okay. No, it would stop right here, wouldn't it? No, my, I, I, uh, I thought it might replace all the characters in the string, but as, as someone here mentioned... It is basically true. working like acid. Yeah. And you are simply submitting the characters that are vulnerable to acid. Yeah. And then it sort of goes through the text until it finds a non-vulnerable character and stops. Cool, thanks. And the other alternative you have would be to use replace. Replace is the alternative operator from PowerShell. That takes a regular expression. However, that again uh, imposes some misunderstandings. Here, for example, if I do this, it works, but I have to escape now the dot because the dot is in regular expressions. It's a placeholder for any character. And this is the way how you can easily convert any text that you would like to be treated literally in regular expressions. So you type, type your text in here, and that's what you get back. That is always what you can safely use with all the PowerShell operators if you really want to uh, use that literally. So he says, if. Yeah, that's very true. That's a very dangerous thing. He's, he's pointing out that in this particular case, this would even work without escaping the dot, because then it would simply replace any character, uh, txt, and it happens to be a dot. But if, if you apply this to a different text, then it would eat away maybe a txt as well as dot txt. So, Very good, yes. And you also would need an anchor if you want to only replace at the end because otherwise the replace operator replaces it anywhere. It's not like, like a trim where it goes trim end or trim start. Great. Good. Quirks with parameters. Here's a real life question. Someone was sorting the numbers one to three and then he wanted to turn that around. Basically, that's what he did. This is how he descended, sorted descending. And then he was wondering why this one would not sort, although it is basically the same thing. It's just he was wondering if formatting made an issue. Like the only difference is that he sort of put this brace onto the next line. Hmm? <laughs> he doesn't know how to code. That's the reason why we have best practice. You know, there's one tiny little thing that he didn't see. This. He was look, looking at the numbers and said, why isn't it sorting, damn it? And in reality, best practice tells you, always use named parameters. Don't use the evil, politically incorrect positional parameters unless it's code that fades away in 10 milliseconds. So it's code that you do interactively. Anything that stays for, for longer should be written. Yeah, that's what he asked. He was doing philosophical questions. Does that mean where do brackets go is no, uh, is no religious anymore and stuff like that? But the real true reason was basically, if you write it like this, it works. If you write it like this, it'll tell you what's wrong. So that's much better. The reason is property is expecting something and a script block was put on the next line so property didn't find anything. So what did it do? It says, hey, give me something. And then PowerShell was outputting the script block. So it was not connecting those. Yes, um, th that's a great bridge that you're building. The question would be why 
is he doing this whoop, in the first place? And Jeffrey um, once said, a commandlet should be narrow but deep. It should be narrow, focused on what it should do, but that topic, sh it should cover in depth. So sorting also includes, of course, the parameter descending, where you can change the sort order. However, that is really interesting because it gives you a programmatic way of controlling how the sorting works. In this case, it's dumb because we had descending. But here is an example where it's quite clever. Whoops, sorry, clever here. If you sort IP addresses, IPv4, you can't really sort them because they're string. If you cast them to version, you can. So here, it really is interesting. You're basically telling each and every single thing what it should be. Thank you. And the casting as is, is also interesting. If you didn't do that, do that plenty of times. The as operator is the friendly cast, it's the try cast, where you either get the conversion or you get nothing. If you put the, the type in front of it, it's, it's the casting that either gives you the conversion or it gives you an exception. Also, this is the cultural version, a uh, cultural cast. This one has no culture, but if that was a date time and you do it with the as operator, you would get the German date. If you do it on this side, you get the cultural independent, neutral way, the American format. Okay, here's another thing that came up. This, I think, everyone has used some place, test path, can test whether a path, a file, a folder exists. And now the guy was changing, that was a real case, that was a big thing for a company because they, in, they got intermittent problems with their scripts, and they didn't know why. So this was boiled down to the basics, what happened, someone changed the directory and then suddenly this thing returned false, although it obviously existed. Does anyone know why? It was trying to? The, the thing is, the little known fact, it was trying to access the registry. The little known fact is that PowerShell requires a drive letter. The drive letter is the hint for PowerShell to, to figure out the provider. And so if you have a path that doesn't have a drive letter, like a UNC path, I would have loved to fall back by default, if you have a UC path, to the file system provider, but it doesn't. So in this case, it simply is resorting to going to the uh, path where you are right now, which could be completely different. And uh, the, res the resolution would be to simply tell it the provider. You can always use the provider name with two colons in front of a path, and then PowerShell knows what that path belongs to. That's, by the way, very interesting when you, when you say dir registry colon colon, then you are at the root of the registry, that where you can't go with hklm colon. So this is safe, this always works, and it's basically when you do a get ps drive, this is what you need to put there. You need to tell PowerShell what kind of provider the path should use. Okay, uh, quirks with prompt. I don't know if you've ever tried to reprogram your PowerShell prompt. One of the favorite questions that come up is, if you do this, why is PowerShell also adding its own prompt? Does anyone know? Yes, PowerShell is really smart because it looks, as, it looks at your own prompt function and as long as your prompt function returns something, it is, it is happy with that. But if your prompt function does not return something over the output channel, and this one is simply writing write host into the console, then it assumes, oh, I have nothing to display, so it always adds this. The resolution would be to simply output something, even if it's a blank. Pardon me? Three characters? No, one, one is okay. One worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, if one doesn't work, add more characters until it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now here's another one. Quirks with error action. Here is a commandlet, and I'm using error action silently continue. Error action silently continue is what we would call software cortisol. The error isn't gone, but you can't see it anymore. So use it wisely and rarely. But why is the error still occurring? Dot net exception? It's basically, yeah, it's, it's basically a so-called terminal error 
or exception. And I never like terminal except or terminating exception. I never like this, these, these wordings because um, to me, why is it terminating? To me, I would only distinguish between exceptions that are handled by the commandlet and exceptions that are not handled by the commandlet. Just view it as a commandlet is simply a bunch of code and it has an error handler and the author of the commandlet can decide which, which exceptions the commandlet should handle. And typically all security related exceptions, that's something that seems to be a best practice, are not handled by the commandlet, so you always see them. The solution to this would be, of course, to use try and catch or trap. Um, however, if you use try and catch, why is this not raising, or why is this still showing this exception? This is the other type of error. This would be a non-terminating error. So this one is one that the commandlet internally handled and then told PowerShell directly. So it never was visible to your try-catch. And that's, an, again, something often, um, well, a pitfall for, for, for many. What you would need to do is add error action, silently continue. Uh, stop, that is. Stop. Whoa. Damn. Stop. And then when, oh, that was cool. Let's see if we get a picture back. Mm-hmm, this is good. So when you, when you do that, then the commandlet will raise its own exception. Uh, and that's the one that you can see. However, error action stop has um, side effects as well. Why do I only see the first error? What with all the other errors? Now I'm going through the Windows folder recursively looking for PowerShell files. Hmm? Yes, exactly, that's a problem. I, I had to say error action stop to get the exception, but that of course means that the commandlet stops. It does not continue anymore. So what do you do if you want the command commandlets to go till the end and still see all the errors? And the solution to that would be use error variable. Error variable is basically you saying, don't show me any errors, but report them to my variable, my errors, or whatever you want to like, uh, want, would like to name this. And then you are instructing the error handler in the commandlet to do whatever you want. And that's cool because my errors can immediately tell you how many errors there were during the operation of the commandlet. And it is simply an array of exceptions, the same kind of exceptions that you would have seen in your catch block. So you can go ahead and simply pick some of the information and get a list of what were actually the folders that I couldn't access. And if you have PowerShell 3 or better, I think, automatic unrolling was 3, I think. Automatic unrolling was PowerShell 3. Then you can even write it like this. You can simply take the array and access a property from one of the array members. That's cheating, but it's cool. Okay. Quirks with plus equals. Who of you has ever used plus equals? Yes. So I've <laughs> okay. Now here is something that is interesting. That is boiled down to the, to the code that, is, that matters. I've seen this type of code in so many code reviews. Often people are using this type to sort of have a loop and they're going to many machines and retrieving data, building some kind of inventory. And then they have an array and they are adding things to that array and it is slow, but if you only add like a zero, 10 times as many, you don't, it doesn't take 30 seconds, it takes minutes or the machine will hang eventually. And the reason is plus equals is very convenient, but it's bad because it's basically treating a static array as if it was dynamic. So what it does is whenever you say plus equals, it creates a new array copies the old array in the new array and then adds that additional item, which is slow. And if you have too many of this, it, it really gets out of hand. So there were some smart asses, .NET developers, they found out that there is a better way of doing this. 
and they simply did it like this. So they basically took that array and casted it to ArrayList. ArrayList is a special object that has a method called add. So no, you cannot use plus equals, but you can say add. Add is a way of fast, very, very efficiently adding new elements. This takes almost less than one, 0 0.1 second, this as well. And this one, well, this is simply random. You see it's very fast. And it, it stays fast, even if you have more data. But these smart asses, they didn't know that PowerShell is even smarter. You just have to do it right. You have to see where the strength of Power th PowerShell is. PowerShell is already giving you arrays. So this was where we started. See, array and plus equals. This was adding a different type of array. And now here's the best way. Simply don't do anything. Leave it there, put it to the output channel, and then save everything in a variable. You get the same array. PowerShell internally is using array lists. This is very efficient, very fast, and just the best way of doing this. I can only say, take a look at your code. If wherever you use an array and plus equals, turn it into something like this, and you have a tremendous performance increase. OK. Then there was a question. I think, Rob, it was from you. I'm not mentioning names here, but this, I'm just mentioning that name because it was a good question. What's the difference between for each and for each object? Well, sometimes it seems that people say, for each object, the pipeline type of thing, that's the powershell way of doing it. That's the modern type of thing. And for each, that loop is, well, maybe for backwards compatibility, maybe it sneaked in somehow, but it's obsolete. And that's not true. You see two, two approaches here, using for each and for each object. For each is simply using variables. For each object is using, well, it's kind of, sort of blended into, this is a pipeline operator. And the difference is, it's your choice of what you want to do. If you use for each, then you use the classic way of using variables as transport container. You need to first fill the variable, burn all the memory, and once you have done that, you can very efficiently and fast use a classic for each loop to iterate through that. This paradigm is really, just imagine you want to watch a video. You have two choices, you can download it or you can stream it. This is the download and this is the stream. The stream is very fast, very resource, low on resources, but you can only do it once. This you can repeat as many times as you want, so it's a choice. A choice you have and you should carefully take. Uh, so again, this is the high memory and this is the low memory streaming paradigm. And since in, in IT and administration, most of the times you're not really concerned about, about a couple of seconds. You're more concerned about resources. That's why using the pipeline is a good thing. What you should avoid though is this. This is stupid. Don't ever <laughs> download it and then stream it. So if you have downloaded it already in a variable, then use this approach. That's very convenient. It, you edited it, I think, in partial four. It is the same syntax that you have with, with this one. So it's really easy to switch over. And whenever you have a variable, when your pipeline starts with a variable, simply use this. And you are skipping over the streaming stuff, and it's still fast. OK. Here's a funny question. I, well, sometimes it's Friday late, you burned the midnight oil and you, you ask a stupid question, I don't know, maybe it's a good question. Why is the upper wear object not yielding any result and the lower one is? Or the original question wa was, what do the braces do here? Yeah, yeah, these are the two different syntaxes of where object. You can use where object without a script block. That's this one. But then you don't have a dollar underscore because you don't have a script block. Then you would have to say length directly. So obviously this doesn't yield anything because that is never, never uh, true. This is the classic approach, classic where object where you give them a delegate, a script block delegate that determines whether that uh, object can go. So basically, this would be the right thing to do if you wanted to use the short syntax. Don't use braces, you don't need that, or, but simply use length and not dollar underscore length. So typical Friday question. And this is the other, the uh, classic approach. 
Here's another thing. Quirks with new objects. Who of you is creating new objects using add member? Yeah, you, you can admit it. <laughs> is creating new objects really this hard? You need to know what add member is for. Add member is a really specific and very awesome commandlet in that it enhances original objects without changing the type. That is amazing. It stays whatever type it was before, and you are dynamically adding members to it. That's great. But it's not necessarily the best way of creating new objects. Here's a better way. Just use PS custom object. That's awesome. Uh, it was introduced in PowerShell 3, I think. Yeah, I, I guess it was 3. Because what you can do here is you submit a hash table, where it almost looks like a hash table. It's, I think, one syntactical thing, where you have key value pairs. And you, as you can see, you can even have active code here in here and creating the content of your properties. And the result is this object. So that's a, one of the efficient, most efficient ways of creating objects. And there are more. Um, Jeffrey already mentioned classes. If you wanted to have a blueprint for your objects, you can use a class. This would be the new PowerShell 5 class syntax where you have a constructor where you can sort of submit, oh, I'm missing this one, submitting the data into the constructor and creating a new object. Or if you always wanted to do the same thing, you would leave away the constructor like that. You would simply add the logic to your parameterless constructor and then always get whatever information you want. <clears throat> Who of you is using PowerShell 5 classes? Wow, awesome. We should sh uh, share a couple of use cases because you can do amazing things, but when, when, you're, you, when you're new to these .NET classes, uh, it's always good to see what others do. So at the core of many of these answers, we had something that was the script block. Any one of us knows what a script block is. It's curly braces. To me, that is m the most important thing to understand when you learn PowerShell, and even for advanced PowerShellers. It handles input, it handles the output, it handles the scoping and also parsing and syntax errors. It's the DNA of the PowerShell language, if you will. And to prove that point, I would like to show you just a couple more examples where a script block can even help you with this darn return statement. And uh, basically, why is that useful? First of all, this is my perfect picture for a script block. Uh, I'm a movie fan, and so if you know the movie um, Illuminati, you know that in Switzerland at the CERN they were creating antimatter, and in, in order to, for the ant antimatter to not explode, it needed to be kept in some device in vacuum and uh, magnetic field. Basically, a script block does the same with PowerShell code. It keeps it some, in some container so that, that it doesn't go, go off. And you can transport it or give it to people or do things with it. And basically, here's the first example. You can use it. This is a lazy example. Sometimes you only have strings, like a series of strings, but I would really love to have a string array. Here, you can leveraging the parameters, the input stream that is built into a, a script block. So this basically creates a string array out of these simple texts. You don't have to manually add quotes and commas and stuff. Paste it in there and you have your array. You can then convert it to whatever you want. So it shows that basically it's not the PowerShell function that implements the par param block and the input. It is the script block. And you can call the script block like directly. So input auto parsing. An output, it is automatically generating an array from everything that you send to the output stream. That's also a great benefit that you can use. And that's the fixing return values. You know, when you start using PowerShell as someone who comes from a different language, it's strange, like Jeffrey said, anything that you leave behind before you exit the function is automatically going to the output, output channel. Now, a script block is the DNA of PowerShell, so it has an input channel and an output channel. This would be a function that would leave behind all kind of garbage. So when I call this, I get this, I get get service, I get this, and this. All goes, I, I, I left this out even. So you got four results, wrap, nicely wrapped into an array. And so the solution would be to simply use the output functionality of a script block. So I'm simply adding this little script block here, I'm calling it without scope, so it's running in my scope, 
but I am nulling its output channel. That's the best way. If you simply add that to your body of the function, at the end, simply return what you want, you get what you want. And that is really convenient because sometimes when you have large functions, you don't know necessarily which method really sends some output. If you do an add to an array list, for example, it sends you a number where it added something. That is all garbage that goes to your output. To me, this was really useful if you are lazy. If you're not lazy, you can identify the places where the unwanted output cre is created and null it. <coughs> okay, now, fast and reusable code. That's another thing that I would like to bring to your attention because when you look at this, this is ad, ad hoc code that we all write, we all use for each object to do something to, with an individual object. This, for example, would count. It's a counter. It takes the services, the begin block would initialize this variable, this would increment for every single object that goes to the pipeline, and at the end I would return the number of objects that I got. Why would I do this? Why don't I simply save the whole result in a variable and do dot count? It's again download versus streaming. Um, it's just a matter of how much resources you want to invest. The variable dot count is like if, if you have an intersection, traffic intersection, and you want to know how many cars are going, you could have two students. The one student that would do the variable dot count thing would reroute all cars on a parking lot and then at, at the evening would go and count all cars and would say, now you can go. And this would be a student with a clicker who is simply clicking and not disturbing the data. And this is another example. It would simply add uh, or filter out files that are 10 days young or less. Now, this is not the special thing. The special thing is if you want to you reuse this more often, if you want to count things more often or filter things more often, then you can change this into a reusable function very easily. For each, it's simply creating a prototype function with three blocks, begin, process, end. If you want to put this into a reusable code, it looks like this. This is a function that does exactly the same. So this is now your code. It's much more beautiful. You can sort of export your function to a module so you can use it all the time. And it is, and that's the added benefit, it is at least twice as fast. It's much faster for whatever reason, Bruce. You know the details, I don't know. <laughs> but it's really much faster. Um, and the same thing, this was simply converting for each. If you wanted to convert where object, it would simply look like this. Wait. This would filter any file that is younger than 10 days because where object is simply a for each object with an if, that's all. So it's again begin block, process block, and if this condition is met, then please put the object again up to the output stream. Um, that I cannot reiterate how important that is in my perspective because reusability is really important. We don't want to write the same code over and over again. And here's another one. Um, <coughs> it's kind of convoluted. <laughs> what I wanted to show you here is not this code. Whenever you use for each object, it is simply running in your own scope. So if you create variables here, they will remain. It's not a separate scope. If you, for some reason, want to control scope, if you want to do something in your function, in your code, that is in a, in a fixed scope, you can simply do it like this. This is the same thing. It's a script block, but this time you can control with this call operator whether you want it to have a scope or when you take a dot, dot sourcing, whether you don't want it to have a scope. So this one would be a for each loop. It's a for each loop with scope. In this case, we don't have a variable MB anymore outside. So also, again, a nice way of controlling scope. And the last thing, this is code that you can use to access a database and if you have a classic loop in here like a while loop or something like that of course you can save the results to a variable we have seen that but does any one of you know how we can change this code that the results from the database could be processed in real time so that I don't have to wait till the whole data set is downloaded how can I add streaming to this Use what? 
use classes. Yes, yeah, good thing about PowerShell Crowd. You ask a question and you have a thousand more answers than I ever imagined. <laughs> I was thinking about script blocks. If you use a script block, how could you wrap around a script block here? Basically, if, uh, if you just take that code, you do it like this. You, you again wrap the whole thing in, in a script block because the script block has this streaming output built in. And then you can do whatever you want, and this is in real time outputted. You can filter, you can do whatever you want, and the result can, you can still save to a var variable. So again, a script block is really very versatile if you, once you start thinking about it. Okay, so um, I saved a little bit of time because my first presentation was too long. Jeffrey was perfect, and I, I was uh, sort of trying to catch the time now. Um, I would like to bring to your attention that we already picked a date for next year, so it's long, a long, a long time to go. But maybe uh, you can write it down somewhere and uh, maybe you have time to come. So this is it for the moment. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, we will have a no break. Uh, we will sort of switch headsets real quick because the one headset I broke this morning. Um, and then we do will right away. And if you have any questions about the code, we have five more minutes for the microphone. Any hands, any question? None, okay.